So we have population growth, we have rising affluence, and we have converting grain into oil, all generating additional demand for grain. That's why we saw a few years ago a tripling of world grain prices, while grain prices right now are about 50% above the historical level. They've not gone back to the historical level, nor do I expect they will. So food is the weak link in the system. We see this not only with grain prices, but the number of hungry people in the world that was declining. It declined until about the beginning of the, 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 the turn of this century, and for the last decade, the number of hungry people in the world has been increasing. That's exactly what happened in Samaria. It's what happened in, uh, with the Mayans. The number of hungry people began to increase. This, I think, is a trend that deserves far more attention than we're giving it. With rising food prices and more hungry people, the number of failing states is increasing. If you look at the list of failing states, each year it gets a little longer, adding another two or three countries, typically. And that lengthening list of failing states raises a disturbing question, which is, how many failing states before we have a failing global civilization? The answer is, we don't know. We haven't been here before. This is new territory for us. In response to this situation, we've devised Plan B, which is in the book that Michael was talking about. Plan B has four principal components. One, cutting carbon emissions 80% by 2020, not by 2050, which is what politicians like to talk about, by 2020. We didn't ask, you know, what will be politically feasible. We asked how much and how fast do we have to cut carbon emissions if we want to save the Greenland ice sheet. And I sort of use that as a metaphor for saving civilization. Because if we can't save the Greenland ice sheet, we are in trouble. The second component is restoring the Earth's natural system, forests, grasslands, fisheries, soils, and so forth. It's entirely doable. We worked out a budget. This, this restoring natural systems, soil conservation, reforestation, etc., eradicating poverty, which is one of the four major components, and stabilizing population, altogether budgeted out at about $200 billion of additional expenditures per year. That's quite a bit. But we're spending 1.2 trillion, six times that now, for military expenditures. We need to redefine security. We have, we have a 20th century mindset, a century dominated by two world wars and a cold war, that the threats to our future are military. The real threats to our future are climate change, falling water tables, rising food prices. These are the threats to future security, the threats to future political stability. Let me talk for a minute about cutting carbon emissions. It takes a lot of effort, but if we just went to the most efficient lighting technologies now available worldwide, in most cases that's compact fluorescent bulbs, in, in some situations, like street lights, it's LEDs, light emitting diodes. If we go worldwide to that, we can close 705 of the 2,400 coal fired power plants in the world from electricity savings, just completing the transition that's already underway of shifting to the most economically um, available lighting technologies on the market today. Let me cite two examples of how fast things are beginning to happen on the energy front in the transition from fossil fuels to renewable sources of energy, going from oil, coal, and natural gas to wind, solar, and geothermal. Last year, let me back up. 
China, a latecomer to wind energy, has been doubling its wind generating capacity each year for five years. Last year it installed more new wind capacity than we did. But beyond that, the Chinese government, government announced last year their wind-based program. This consists of seven wind mega complexes that the, a government agency is coordinating the development of. These wind mega complexes will have a total generating capacity of over 130,000 megawatts. Think 130 coal-fired power plants. These wind complexes will generate the same amount of electricity as 130 coal-fired power plants. That's like building a new coal-fired power plant every week for the next two and a half years. It is huge. We've never seen energy thinking in any field on this scale before. Europe. Last year, while the governments of Europe were preparing for Copenhagen, a consortium of companies led by Munich Re, Munich Reinsurance, a reinsurance company insures insurance companies. Munich Re, Deutsche Bank, Siemens, a dozen leading companies all together announced the Desert Tech project. Desert EC on the end, Desert Tech. This is a project to harness the solar resources of North Africa, integrating them into a European North African grid that would also include the wind resources of Northern Europe and the North Sea, to largely power the economy of Europe and North Africa with renewable sources of energy. The potential here is huge. The Algerians point out that in their desert, they have enough harnessable wind energy, sorry, enough harnessable solar energy to power the world economy. That sounds like a, a mathematical error, but it's not. Those of you who read the energy literature bit know that the sunlight striking the earth in one hour will power the world economy for one year. So it's not a question of do we have enough solar energy, enough renewable energy, whether it's solar or wind. I haven't even talked about geothermal. But a US-China team recently completed uh, a survey of China's wind resources. They pointed out that China has enough harnessable wind energy to increase its current electricity consumption sevenfold. Again, or in this country, we have three, three of our 50 states, North Dakota, Kansas, and Texas, have more harnessable wind energy than we could ever consume in this country. So the, the, the resources are there. The question is how to quickly make the shift from fossil fuels to renewables.